What's good? What is going on, world? We are back with another episode of the same episode that we tried <laughs> to create before. I don't know. I'm probably going to put that episode in the front of this episode. So okay. So people can think that they watch an episode and then they like abruptly get cut off and now you're seeing us. <laughs> like, hey, and we're back. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nah, but uh, we are here. It's the business of love. Uh, I don't even feel like doing the intro again because I did it already. Well, uh, microphone check. One, two, one, two. It's your girl, Bree Woo. You know what I came to do. Oh, whoa, no. <laughs> um, don't ever do that again, bro. <laughs> don't ever do That's that again. That's my intro. Um, <laughs> That's the outro. <laughs> So listen, we are here today. Um, of course, you know, we're, it's the business of love, so we are busy, but we are making it a duty to remain on schedule and make sure that we keep this content consistent. This topic is super, super interesting. I think it is funny to some degree, but I feel like it's something that everybody can pretty much relate to. Um, cause at some point I think everyone has had to fake something, right? So fake it till you make it is the topic. And we are going to dive into two different spaces, yes. both the personal side and also the business side of faking it until you make it. Yes. So what do you want to start with? Um, so, I mean, the last time, right, I started with the quote, which is uh, fake it till you make it is an English aphorism, which suggests that by imitating confidence, competence and optimistic mindset, a person can actually realize those qualities in their real life and achieve the results they seek. And you said this came out what year was this developed or? So, no, the, 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 the saying of mm -hmm. fake it till you make it has been dated back to around 1973. Got you. So. And I felt like that was pretty recent for, I mean, for the term, because I could have swore this was something that's been used forever. But 1973, that's still kind of, you know, somewhat new. You know what? I think that, um. I think that that was around the time when mass media really started to have its super influence on people, mm -hmm. right, and society. Um, and I think that that's when things started to get a little less real um, and become really focused on programming, mm -hmm. right, like TV programming and kind of like programming us to live by comparison, number one. Um, and then also programming us to uh, desire things that, you know, don't necessarily make a difference in our life. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, like, you know, I love Oprah and everything that she's done, but I feel like that whole you get a car, you get a car, you get a car kind of made people very uh, unappreciative mm -hmm. of the work that it takes to get a car, mm -hmm. right? They almost just felt like it was just like, oh, they're they just giving out cars out here right. left and right. So, you know what I'm saying? I could get whatever kind of car I want. Not to say that I'm blaming her for that, mm -hmm. but I'm just saying that was one of those moments in, you know, TV history that to me kind of stuck out. Stuck out. Um, and, and kind of, I looked at like comparison. I felt like that was a time that a lot of us started to live in comparison, right? My mom watched the Oprah show every day. Mm -hmm. So I can remember her responses to certain things that were going on in that show um, and kind of just being like, eh, it's just a show. Like, you know what I'm saying? You shouldn't yeah. be wishing that you was there or nothing like that. Like, life is good. We mm -hmm. don't need another car. Like, it's just me and you and I can't <laughs> drive yet. So like... <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I just remember going through those things younger and looking at situations and just being like, yo, the TV, right? Like mass media programming. Like I, I told my mom at a very young age that I don't watch the news. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember the day that I decided to stop that I would never watch the news. There was um, a story, right? I can't even remember what the story was about, mm -hmm. literally. But there was a story that was coming on the news that I wanted to hear. And first off, they saved it till the end. But on the news, you know, they do this thing like, coming up tonight, we have a fire in Brooklyn. We have yeah. this, this, that, and a third. And then we have, and it had to be something about like music and kids and whatever, because I was young. And it was like this story that you're going to want to hear. And I had to watch the entire episode 
right, of all of these negative things, fires that were happening mm -hmm. all over the world in places that weren't even, I shouldn't have said Brooklyn, I should have said Belarus, because it was like, not that that's not going to affect me, but like you're telling me about world news, right, like just to try to convince me that I should be afraid of certain things. Mm hmm and I just remember those feelings and then going down that, that, that rabbit hole of finally getting to the end. And I kid you not. And, and, and I, I remember this feeling of just, I think that was the first time I was literally pissed off mm -hmm. because as a kid, as a child, like literally like my blood was boiling because they started doing the segment about what it was that I wanted to, to hear at the end. Mm -hmm. And then they started rolling the credits 30 seconds later. So like they were doing the segment. The segment was literally about 30 seconds mm -hmm. to maybe 45 seconds. But as they were doing it, they put the screen that I could be watching it on mm -hmm. small in the corner and started rolling yep. the credits. And I was like, nah, yo. Yeah. Like, y'all got to be kidding me. Y'all made me watch all this yep. fear mongering in order to get to what I want to. Mm -hmm. So. I said all that to say this, that like, I feel like that was around the time when like, you know, mass media's influence and TV programming really came into play. I agree. And so I feel like that was around the time when that ideology came around and it was like, you know what? I might not have what I see on TV, but I'm a fake it until I make it type mm -hmm. situation. And so that's why I think me personally, like that the birth of that phrase kind of came about at that time. Got you. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. Okay. And I definitely can resonate with that because I know exactly, well, it was a few shows, but I know specifically one show who was notorious for doing that. Mm. They like hype up what you really want to see. And then when you get to it, it's like, all right, and it's over. And then yep. all the credits just start coming down. Yep. Um, but I mean, like I said, do you want to do this starting with the personal faking? Start however you want, babe. So we were discussing this amongst ourselves first because you asked me, have I ever faked an orgasm? Oh, that's where you want to go straight there. I, I gave you the, the option. <laughs> no, because I thought you was going to start the same way that you started the last one. But let's go there. Have you ever faked an orgasm? Yeah. With me? <laughs> yeah, your face got serious. Um, no. I don't like that um and because you think I'm about it. I, I'm really trying to think like... I don't, I don't think so, no. Because truth be told, I ain't think you ever had no orgasms before me. I mean, if, yeah, if we, we've spoken about this before. <laughs> it's been far and few. Hmm. Um, but yeah, no, I don't think I have. That's my honest answer. You don't think you have? No, because I would have remembered that. Like, that's something that you kind of be like. So what made you fake an orgasm? Just to, you know. Get the, get the situation, situation over? yeah, get it over wow. with. Honestly, okay. wait, you oh, okay, no, yeah, I, I see what you're saying now. I kind of had the question mixed up when you first asked, but no, I have not with you. Wait, what did you think the question was? I was listening to the question as in, have you um ever like not have had one or something like that no have you faked yeah no i haven't you've never faked an orgasm period oh i have okay. in my life with you no okay uh we, we got that straight yeah that's Just out the sure. way but cool. in general yes okay so in this light of like fake it till you make it did you did you expect for it to get like did you expect to actually make it like did you were no. you like yo i'm gonna just fake this tonight and then you know maybe tomorrow i'll be able to like actually bust a nut or like <laughs> was it just like i just want to get this done just want to get over with because it was like you can kind of tell when someone is not genuinely trying to make sure that you reach you know your your peak or whatever they're just like you know doing whatever for themselves and in your head you're like yeah, I got a feeling this is going to be one of those times where I just be like, you know. Got you. Just trying to get over with. Okay. I respect that. I um, mean, as a man, I don't think you can. We can. Really? Yeah. Okay. If you're having condom sex. Okay. Yes, that's true. That's true. Because I'm just like, where is it at? <laughs> but, yeah. Okay. I have. Really? Yeah. And was it the same reasoning just to like be like, all right, let me get up out of here type thing? 
Um, yes, but it was largely because I honestly didn't expect to even have sex with this person. Got you. And so in doing so, right, like it was one of those situations where it was like, I knew I shouldn't. I knew this was going to be whack. I knew that this was going to be like, (laughs) just like what it is or whatever the case may be. I'm laughing because I I feel like in your head, you really was saying this. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) It's like, oh man, I knew it. And I'm like, and I, you know, I had an outer body experience where I'm watching myself and like, not for nothing. I had that combo with myself and self just said, yo, fake it. <laughs> like, yo, just, just act like you. Cause I'm, I'm thinking, cause here's the other thing is like, I had someone else that I was supposed to be with that same night. Got you. But this person came first. And okay. was very adamant about us doing something. And I was like, a younger man, right? Like, yeah. you're not going to turn down nothing. Like, That's I didn't, just being offered yeah, to you like Yeah, I that. didn't realize the power that I would have had if I would have said no. Right. right? Like, if I would have said, nah, let's not, whatever. So much whatever power reason, in no. Right. I, I, would, I didn't realize that at the time. And so I went through the means of trying to arouse myself and arouse her and make sure that we... And it was... The thing that, like, I kind of regret because mm. at the end of it, right, not at the end of that, but, like, I, I I said to myself that I wanted to fake it, right, so that I could still have a relationship with this person. Got it. But, and really, I was like, yo, I don't want it to be weird. I'm like, because if, if we just have sex and she knows she ain't making me nut, then it's going to be weird between A weird us. energy. But it was weird because I couldn't not, like, get over that. Mm-hmm. Like every time I saw her, it was like yeah, you couldn't even really like you yeah. couldn't even really do the damn thing. And 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 I went to have sex with someone else the same night. The for same multiple night. Rounds. Yes. Wow. So was it like a person like them, or was it just it was a combination you mentally got no, it? No, no, no. It was a combination of things. It was mostly her. Got it was, you. It was a combination of things that was just like ah, uh, okay, this was not where we were supposed to. Yeah. Be. But. Anyway, let's get back on track. Let's talk about business. Yeah. Because that's what we started with in the last version of this episode Mm -hmm. was business. So now that we've gotten all our personal uh, history info out the way, um, you know, I brought up the idea in the last, you know, episode that, you know, you deal with a lot of people who fake it, Mm -hmm. right, until they make it. Do you have any advice for people with doing that? Is that... Is that something that's foreseeable, right? Because you've done hiring for some of the top companies in the world, mm-hmm. right? Like the Goldman's and the... the uh, Santa Fe. The, yeah. Huge pharmaceutical. Yeah. 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 And the Tory Birches and the, this, the, that, you know, what, like whoever they are, these mm-hmm. are some of the most well-known brands and names and companies yep. in the world. And you've been responsible for the hiring of people to be there. So do you find it beneficial from your perspective for people to fake it until they make it? No, I don't find really? it beneficial because at some point you have to show what you know mm-hmm. and you have to really exhibit those skills that you said you had. And when I was supporting Goldman, there was a lot of people who knew that name would mm-hmm. hold so much weight on their resumes that they was like just trying to get in for a little bit, like mm-hmm. a few months or maybe a year and then go to something else or try to get to another position. Got you. And, you know, you put on this face and you if I'm asking you a question about have you been in this type of situation before? Oh, yeah, I've been in this situation. What would you do in the situation? Oh, well, you know, I. I, I did this and then a little bit of that. And that's where you can kind of tell the people are like, you know, capping. But I would say, no, it's not conducive to your career growth to fake it because unless you have a plan, like okay. I said, unless you have a plan where you're like, okay, three months, I'm going to be in this position. Um, six months, I'm going to be here. But if you're just doing this to get in and you don't know what that plan looks like, I would not do it. Hmm. Because you really might be disappointed. You know, it's so crazy that you say that, right? Because I'm so, like, intertwined with this Web3 world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I made a post the other day about, you know, people being able to get a job without having coding and whatnot. And, you know, I think that I love the fact... One of the reasons why I love this Web3 culture and community is because 
a lot of the people who are hiring individuals are hiring more so based on your passion mm -hmm. for the position than they are your experience. Mm -hmm. Now, you ain't about to get no top level job, right? They're, they're, right. they're not about to make you CFO and you like, yeah, I ain't never ran a <laughs> business before. Then. Like, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of opportunity in these places and spaces for people who are passionate. Keyword passion, though. Yeah, but so I think that the, the you know, to me, faking it till you make it, right, means that you're, like, getting a job that you're not qualified for, right? Or mm -hmm. being in a position that you may not necessarily be qualified for. Yep. Um, Shouts out to Biden. I think he's faking it till he makes <laughs> it. In all honesty, my opinion, I don't think that he's <laughs> quite qualified for this role. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just feel like, to me... I kind of, I kind of like that. Mm -hmm. And like, you know what I'm saying? I don't like the connotation of fake it till you make it. But I love the idea of like believing yourself enough that you know that you can develop the skill set to mm -hmm. be here. That you can actually take on whatever comes. Now, it does come with passion. I say, you know, more so obsession, mm -hmm. right? Like when you become obsessed with something, I think that that supersedes passion. Yeah. And so the people who are obsessed about Web3 are always going to be able to win in this space, right? That's how I was able to gain so much knowledge mm -hmm. was because I became utterly obsessed we with know. it. You know. <laughs> it's how much time I spend in spaces and yep. learning and whatnot. But... Um, so yeah, I'm the type of person where I like to reward that type of thinking. I think that we need more of that in certain spaces because now you can't do that as a doctor or nothing mm -hmm. like that, but in certain spaces, we need people who have not been conditioned to only learn one way or one thing. The other thing that we need is people who are who do have the capability to learn on the go or yep. on the job because it just it it doesn't present so much of a rigorous thinking right so many times a lot of these companies end up dying off because they're stuck in this mentality of if it ain't broke don't fix it yep. right but when you have somebody who's like quote unquote faking it until they're making it or just believing in themselves enough to like get the project done mm -hmm. i think that those people are going to bring in a very new type of perspective yep um and you know in the Bible, I'm not a sayer of the Bible too much, but in the Bible, it says stay childlike. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you are faking it until you're making it, it's pretend. Right. And we haven't pretended anything in years. Right. Yeah. Like you stop pretending once you become an adult. And so I love that because I feel like it brings us back to that nostalgic, you know, era of how we thought. Yeah. Right. Like I can use my mind to curate whatever it is that I want to curate in this situation. Now, again, right. The laws of physics and nature are the only real two laws that you need to abide by. So if physically you are incapable, right, then or just nature says you can't do it, mm -hmm. then I get that. But I love that idea of fake it till you make it. I just hate the terminology. Yeah, right? it's definitely the terminology that makes it seem like, eh. Like, what are you faking? But you need to change it, like pretend till you get to the end or something like that, because for real, because it's like, you know, like faking it just has that like, yo, you know, you're not it. Mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, you're not it. But like pretending is like you actually believe that. Yeah. So I don't know. It's, that's just that's just my take on it. I actually do kind of reward that type. of. It's a very good take, though. Yeah. I mean, even like you said, with Biden. Right. I feel like a lot of people were inspired by Trump and his winning of the presidency because it's like this guy is not like he don't know a lick about politics. That's what I was going to say. You know, I'm glad you brought him up because I feel like he was the king of fake it till you mm -hmm. make it. You know what I'm saying? He yeah. was the, the number one fake it till you make it individual. Um because he was super, super unqualified mm -hmm. for that job. But he believed role. in himself but to do he it. he believed in himself enough that he was able to actually achieve that seat. And there are some things that I've seen him do that, to me, projected what we need in a leader. 
mm-hmm. not his beliefs or his ideologies or his racism or some of his comments, but some of his mannerisms, I feel, are what we needed in a leader of, quote unquote, the free world. Mm-hmm. Right. Like I think we needed that in order for us to maintain our bully position. Right. We need someone who's not afraid to be aggressive. And I feel like Biden is way too passive mm-hmm. in order to be the, the I, I don't even want to keep going on. I was going to say we're not going to go into politics, yeah, but yes. Yes. Um, but yeah, fake it till you make it. <laughs> I was trying to decide whether or not I was going to get that because it's somebody calling a loft. But this is what happened yesterday, too. So hopefully I can just text them later or call them back. But yeah, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> um. Uh, okay, so when it comes to the business, I definitely agree with that. Now, as a business owner, mm-hmm. how much do you utilize that term? Figure till you make it. Do you have to at all? Well, here's the thing. As an entrepreneur, I think that that's all you know. Mm-hmm. Right? As an entrepreneur, you are doing nothing but faking it until you make it. Mm-hmm. Because, like, for me, there was no guidebook, no handbook, nothing that I read that said, this is how you run a business, the business that you're trying to run, Mm -hmm. right? Because some of the things that I was doing when I first opened up the loft were like unseen, unheard of. Nobody was doing that. I literally built a compound for us to be able to do all types of things. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know how valuable content creation was going to become, right? So I didn't fully see what like I needed to do in order to make a content creation compound. Yeah. This was just the space that I saw the ability to do a lot of different things and yeah. to make it happen. And in order for that to be any bit of a success, I had to believe in myself and my ability to do it. Right. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of people don't even know, but like right before I got the law, if I had gotten robbed mm-hmm. for every dollar that I had, So with me even going into the loft, right, paying the deposit, right, like like for me to move in there, I'll never forget I had to pay Mm. $7,215, right? Like that was the, the initial payment of like you can get the keys and all that stuff once you do this. And so I paid that, right, like after I had gotten robbed, I had no money. I paid that money and I really didn't have a lot left. Like Mm -hmm. I didn't have the next month's rent. I didn't have no runway. I didn't have like a budget set for me to buy equipment and stuff. I had to figure it out. Like I had to like believe in myself enough. So like until the law started making money, it was fake. Yeah. It was fake. I was showing people things like I have and videos. And I had no idea. Yeah. I'm going to be honest. Like, I think we visited you at the loft your first or second week of being there. Mm-hmm. And it was just, it just, you wouldn't have thought that had happened to you. Mm-hmm. Like, it was just, it was crazy. It's not something that I talk about. It's not something that I tell a lot of people. But it is something that is the truth. And it's part of my story. Um, I'm going to probably start telling it more because mm-hmm. people definitely do need to know and understand that, like, yeah, you can come back from anything, right? And yes. So, um, I'm going to probably just really tell that whole story at one point. But, um, yeah, I was faking it. Like, I, it was fake. It was me That's showing crazy. people, like, hey, this I'm going to have this like this. Mm-hmm. This is going to be this room. We're going to use this You gave that. us a whole tour. I'm going to throw parties in here. I'm going to set this up like this. Da, da, da. And then... You know, as time progressed, I made all of those things happen. Yep. Right. I was there for four years, three years, three and a half years, mm. something like that, like three and a half. Because I visited you there, what, 20 late? It was like three and a half years. 16, 17? Yeah. Yeah. Because I didn't renew my lease and I believe I had a three year lease. Got you. So, um, yeah. That was. Um, that was that was all I knew was mm-hmm. fake it till you make it. But I mean, we can go further even back, right? Like when I when I decided, like, yo, I'm not gonna work at AT and T no more. I'm gonna just DJ full time. Mm-hmm. I was faking it. I was faking it, mm. right? Like because I wasn't this world renowned DJ. Like I wasn't somebody who all the other DJs knew. I remember one of the most influential moments in AT and T was when DJ Camillo walked in. Mm-hmm. He had no idea who I was. 
Right. I was behind the counter. I was the guy that was supposed to be helping him. But at the time, he was one of my favorite DJs. He was the guy that, like, if some if a, a magician could have came down and said, trade your life with somebody, <laughs> ah, oh, make me Camilo. Like, that's who I want to be. He's in clubs. He's on the radio. He's killing it. And he's nice at it. Right. And he has this dope personality on the Like, that's where I want to be. Yeah. He walks into the damn store and don't know who I am. Mm-hmm. And so that influenced me to be like, nah you was djing at the time i was still djing but i wasn't i wasn't this dj who i you know who i became once i quit gotcha i was not well known in like i wasn't well respected in those spaces i hadn't been able to to lock in with those people i wasn't Mm -hmm. opening for people like that i wasn't doing parties in other cities and whatnot Mm -hmm. until i decided to take that leap of faith or whatever you want to call it and fake it until i make it like that was exactly what I did. Got you. That was exactly what it was that I did. Got so, you. I I believe that the fake it till you make it model, right, can actually lead to uh, success as long as you believe in yourself enough and if you become obsessed with whatever it is that you're doing. Right. So, and that's the, that's the thing. Like, a lot of people tend to uh, just think of the fake it part and not the work that you have to put in while you're faking it. Exactly. Yeah, that's definitely a huge component to it. If I had to say that I ever... Actually, I have. I did. I have faked it before in a, a business sense. Um, when I first started blogging and stuff and doing a lot of the Hot 97, whatever, all of that, I was in college and broke and um, I was doing the internship at 97 and I was really trying to network as much as possible and, you know, connect. But at the same time, if you're not getting paid for this, you tend to think like, OK, what am I really doing this for? Mm-hmm. And um, that's when I really had to be honest with myself and be like, is this a career that you can see yourself being in long term? Because if so, you're going to have to pretty much, you know, knuckle down and eat this like mm-hmm. you're not going to be getting paid. And I had to say, no, I can't see myself doing this long term. I don't like some of the things that's going on with the station. Um, I don't like the what would you call it? Um objectification of Mm, women mm. and just how you know you're not taken seriously so i said i'm not dealing with this shout out to the women that have you know Mm -hmm. like the nest nitties and uh megan all of that like nah but i I can't i respect that yeah so that's when i just said let me continue going to school for what i'm going to school for and it's not radio and communications and now you your own media uh, company, right? Right. Like right. Now you're doing your own media to yeah. whatever audience that you want. Given the platform, yeah. so it's just it's funny how things work out. Mm. But that was a time where I was faking it, and I was just like, you know, really trying. Yeah, but I don't to... know if that was faking it until you making it. I think that that was faking it to fit in, right? Like that was faking it to be in the you know those spaces. Yeah, like I feel like that was more so of that type of. To a degree, I mean, because it was a while where I was just like really trying to convince myself that this is what I wanted to do. But Mm. then when you realize there's no pay from this Mm -hmm. and I'm the type like since I've been 14, since I was 14, I was working. So I was used to having a check coming in of some sort. This Mm -hmm. was the only time where I had nothing, no income coming in. Like I was probably working part time or something, but I'm paying my own phone bill. I'm paying gas. Like I have a car, you know, so it's just, I've always been more advanced when it came to stuff like that. And, um, I I don't like asking people for money. So the radio had to, (laughs) since since when you're different. Um, ladies, you're a band. That's different. You can ask him for money, Mm. but yeah, that was, that was my sign to skedaddle. I get that. I definitely respect that. Um, But yeah, I mean, I think that I think that like in that case, right, I guess I was faking it. Right. Like being at a nine to five uh, type of situation. I don't think that's in the shot. So you good. Okay. If you was doing that for that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that's in the shot. You good. Okay. Um, Yeah. I I think that I was um, largely probably faking it by being in the nine to five situations that I was in. Um, because I knew that, right. Like that isn't, 
where I wanted to be long term. I just I've always known that like I fly to a different, you know, flight pattern than a lot of other people. So I think that, yeah, me too. I might have been faking it until I made it or until I made up my mind more so. Mm -hmm. Right. Like just being at AT AT&T for so long was me faking it. Like it was really me faking it of like this ain't this ain't really where I want to be. Were you getting comfortable at some point? I think I definitely did get comfortable um, when I was at AT AT&T. The thing that shook me was uh, my brother, Mark, his girl at the time. She, you know, she knew that I was a DJ and really wanted to excel in my career. And, you know, he was my partner. We were like doing events and stuff together. And um, she said something that was very blunt. And she said it to him. She was like, you know, he's either going to be the guy that works at AT AT&T and DJs or he's going to be the DJ that used to work at AT AT&T. And it was a slap in the face. Right. Because here I was thinking, yo, I got a good job. I'm making good money. I'm in the city. I'm enjoying it. I'm happy, whatever. Like and I DJ on the side. Right. Right. But I wasn't really like looking at how much of my own potential I was wasting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, it it always takes a woman to kind of spark that ego centered, um, I guess, drive yeah. in a man, right? Oftentimes it does take that. And so, right, it, it just, it slapped my ego in the face hard. And I was just like, oh, nah, <laughs> nah. Like it took me, I'm not gonna stop. It took me a couple of days to sit with that. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like I did that the next day and started making a plan. Like, no, it took me a few days to sit with that. Mm-hmm. And then I got around to being like, all right, how do I exit this place? Right, yeah. like how do I get out of here? Um, with my dignity still intact, right? Like with, you know, not, you know, jeopardizing relationships. Like how do I make this leap? How do I get from where I am to, you know, closer to where I want to be? And, um, it was all because of that conversation, right? That, that really like kicked me in the ass and started like, yeah, it was, it was that statement, um, that really made me sit down and, and then, you know, Shouts to my brother again because you know I I asked him for help, mm-hmm. right? Like I, I and it was more so like I needed somebody to talk it out with. Yeah, right? like I needed somebody to be able to have that conversation of like, what does this even look like? Like I'm saying that I want to do this, but like I, you gotta have a plan. Yeah, you can't just like do it with no plan. Like you, you can, but like if you want to be successful at it, you you better have a plan. Mm-hmm. And so it was like we developed a budget. We developed three. Bl- three budgets, right? The ramen noodle budget, the medium budget, and then the steak and lobster budget, right? Like what would I need every single day, right? If I wanted to eat steak and lobster every single day, Mm -hmm. how much money would I need at the end of the month? Yeah. Right. And if I wanted to eat ramen noodles every single day, right? What's the minimum that I could survive on if, right? Like if I take this leap and I don't have this consistent money coming in. Mm -hmm. And so once I do the math on that, then I know, okay, cool. That just means I need X amount of private gigs a month, X amount of clubs a month, X amount of this, like just, then I know what my goal is, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have those goals, then you just kind of just winging it. And you really like, I'm not going to say that you're doomed, or mm-hmm. you're setting yourself up to fail, but it's a lot less likely that you reach your target if you don't have one. Right. So I had to really start putting those targets on board so that I could start throwing darts at them and be like, okay, look, you know, the goal, like I could actually survive with one gig a week. Mm-hmm. Ramen noodle budget. Cool. If I'm doing one gig a week, I'm making X, Y, and Z a month. That's that's cool. I could, I could survive off of that. Yeah. But like the goal, right, is seven gigs a week. And then, because Camillo's my man's, right? Like, that's the guy I'm looking up to. I'm watching him do 15 gigs in a week, right? right? And I'm like, how do I get to that? Because once I get to that, it ain't like, I ain't even worried about the steak and lobster budget. Now I could buy the restaurant. like, yeah. And I can tell them to cook me whatever. Like, that's where I need to go. Right. And so, yeah, I think that... um I'm super grateful for that conversation and I'm also grateful for the plan. But like I said, I was faking it until I made it. Wow. And that's one thing that I can say I really respect about you. Aside from being like your girl, I feel like you've always have 
and you always say you have a go with the flow type of attitude, but you still have goals in place that mm-hmm. you want to surpass and that you have, you know, that you focus on. And I feel like sometimes your goals, they change a little bit um, because you see where you are and you're like, oh, I definitely can attain that or Mm -hmm. I can do that. So I can honestly say that's something I admire and it inspires me too because my goals, I kind of put to the side depending on what I have going on, but it's always um, something that I try to keep up here. Yeah, I mean, as, as as time progresses, right, my goals, um, my goals get bigger, but the targets get smaller, mm-hmm. right? Because in order for me to hit that bullseye, there's a lot less room for error mm-hmm. the higher that I climb. And so the goals may be larger, but it's not an episode. <laughs> it doesn't fail. But the targets... Um, the targets are, are a lot, you know, smaller for me to be able to see. Um, because like I said, there's, there's a lot less room for error and I really need to be on point. Mm-hmm. Like I really need to be on point. And the other thing is too, it just causes me to focus more, right? Like if you have a super small target, you have to be laser focused. Yep. If it's a huge target, you can do like this and throw the dart and it'll land probably somewhere on the target. It might not be a bullseye, but you've landed on the target. And so I think that a lot of times I was running around like this, you know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Until I started making more definitive plans, definitive moves. And really because of my success that I've had in certain things. And it's hard sometimes to stop and look back and be like, wow, like, I, you know, I left at and Right. Largely because a DJ from Hot 97 walked in and didn't know who I was. And then I remember Mark and I making the goal of saying, yo, we're going to get you on Hot 97. Uh-huh. And we did that. Yep. Like I, I did that. I was a guest DJ on Hot 97. I've done that. And so to be able to say like, oh, shit, I really did do what I said that I was going to do. The amount of times that I can look back and say that, right? The amount of times that I can look back at some of those, like some of the footage that I had when I first got the loft and I was telling people, this is going to be here. I'm going to put this here. I'm going to have this set up like this. I'm going to do this, do that. Like, and then I look back and like some people will still send me videos like, yo, remember this party in the loft? And I'll be like, yo, I wasn't even there for that. Mm. That party was huge, but I wasn't even there. I've showed you clips of parties and album launches and whatever Yo, shouts to cook man cook cook was really cook was really my man's that really held a lot of stuff down in the law for me like i just thought about something you should compile all that footage and create a like mini documentary Mm. the loft and just you know really explain how much of a staple it was in jersey culture because there really was a point in time where a lot of events were being held there Mm -hmm. like Almost every event that you could think of. There were events that have never been done before that I was doing mm-hmm. there, right? Like the speed shooting event, that that was an idea, mm-hmm. right? Like, yo, let me put a bunch of models in a place. Let me put 20 photographers in a place, give them all stations yep. and let the models rotate and then get a bunch of designers in there to like put different things on the models. And now everybody gets to network. Yep. People get their photos. People get like... That was something that I literally created from thin air. Like, it that, was just an idea. Um, hard conversations, like the DJ oh. type summit that you had where well, it was know, media. Was the, ask the DJ. Ask the DJs. Something like that. Yeah. I still have the flyer yeah. that I was on, but it was just such a unique type of event because we didn't know what was going to happen. We thought people was going to be fighting. <laughs> No, but it was just so cool to have a space to do that openly and bluntly as mm-hmm. possible. Yeah. Um, I don't think you had no bodyguards there no, <laughs> for that I've conversation. Had, I've had security in the building very few times for certain events. That one was not one of them, but to think about it, maybe I probably should have. <laughs> Um, you know what I'm saying? It didn't, nothing went down. Everything was no, like it was respectful. It was, it a, was a very event. respectful conversation. I forgot about that event. <laughs> like I, I had completely forgotten about that event, but yeah, some of the events that I've done there were literally things that were, you know, like 
they, they've never been duplicated even, mm-hmm. right? Like people haven't even done them again to that capacity. So yeah, um, yeah, I definitely could probably do like a documentary about the law of man. It would be a, it would be so. The idea, right, the, the concept that I had was I wanted to do a show about the law based on like how, um, you know, like black ink, mm-hmm. you know, day to day stuff that we go through, arguments that we have, how we just be chilling, like beefs or crazy moments and incidents is like, I'll never forget one of the one of the funniest moments, right? Because I used to have a bunch of people, a bunch of the homies would come through to the law mm-hmm. and you know, the loft had this allure, right? That like, if you could have access to it at any time, then you were somebody, right? Like you had some stain. And I'll never forget, somebody brought a female to the loft. And, you know, I opened the door for him. Yo, what's good? All right, cool. Oh, nice to meet you. Cool. And, you know, there was two main rooms, right? That we Mm -hmm. could kick it in. And we walked into the room that we just were chilling in right we had the projector in there we'd be playing video games smoking whatever walked them into the room young lady walks in the room and looks around and basically said like oh i gotta go to the bathroom Mm -hmm. and left she she pulled the rick ross Wait, why? <laughs> she realized that there were about four dudes in there that she had had sexual relations with, and it was uncomfortable for her. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, got you. Because so, I'm like, why'd you leave? Right, but so to me, there were so many different moments that you know happened like that. I was like, man, these things need to be documented. You know what I'm saying? Like, these moments need to be, like, like we could, this is entertainment. Right. right? The, the, was it the, something y'all laughed at after? Yeah, because we had to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> what like, like 30 minutes went past and she still was going nah it wasn't that long it was i think she text i think she texted the dude that she was with or whatever mm-hmm. and we was like yo like like what happened and you hear a snicker from one guy and then you hear a laugh from another guy and they kind of look at each other like yeah <laughs> yeah like and then so it was like mm. all right let's talk about this and you know what i'm saying and it, it came out and we you know we 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 laughed and we had that moment, but I just thought that that was something that I like. I could have developed into something because mm-hmm. of how you know historically, uh, just like every single day there was something that was happening. Mm-hmm. There. Every single day there was a moment there. Every single day there was something that um, either I was doing to somebody. Like I had the vending machine in there, and mm-hmm. people would lose their wallets or their phones, and I would put it in the vending machine. <laughs> So now you have to buy it back. <laughs> like there were just moments of things that were just happening. And I was like, yo, we could definitely create this and turn this into something. I just didn't have the time. And the building was like, it was decrepit. That building was on its way out. So mm-hmm. I just, you know, but I do want to recreate that and make it all happen again. Um, you know, this time, I guess I won't be faking it till I make it. Right. I'll, I'll have the knowledge. So, you know. Yeah. I would love to see some reenactments of these moments. <laughs> I don't know if that's going to happen because I want it to be genuine. Yeah. But um, let's get back to the fake it till you make it. Mm-hmm. You know, let me ask you this. Um, have you ever been in a relationship where you've had to fake it? Right. Like faking, mm-hmm. like hoping that it would get better type stuff i feel like women are more apt to doing that yeah for sure but they're so i would say the last two serious relationships that i had i was faking it to some capacity because Mm -hmm. i was i was settling for a situation that i told myself i i didn't you know like or i wouldn't go for so i was faking it solely based on this is a good person Mm. and then in reality they were faking it because they weren't who they you know portrayed themselves to be so it was just an all-around fake situation which then made me do some real soul searching and take a break from dating altogether Mm. and then in that time i realized what my non-negotiables were and what i really was not going to tolerate no matter how nice the person was like For example, and this is problematic to some, but I told myself and friends that moving forward, my next relationship, I'm not going to be with somebody who is just not financially established. Mm. And it's not in a gold digger way. It's just I need to know that, you know, you have that provider mindset and that 
there's going to be times where I really just don't have to worry about anything. Mm -hmm. Like I don't, and this is the funniest part. I felt like I had to tap into my masculine energy a lot in those previous relationships. And now that I'm fully tapped into, you know, my feminine energy, I'm like, Oh, I'm not going back to that. Like it's just not something that I should have to deal with as a woman, especially a woman who brings a good amount of things to the table. So yeah, there's just no, there's no more faking it in a relationship space at least. Yeah. I think that that's, that that's super unhealthy for people to have to fake it until you make it in a relationship. Right. Because I like, I like, you know, I was going to tweet this the other day. I think like one of the illest moments in a relationship is just like watching your girl or your significant other period go from cool to goofy. Mm-hmm. And like we've spoken about that. Like I had this, prior notion about you that you were just some <laughs> super professional always on Everyone never laughing never joking like <laughs> type of individual right mm-hmm. and then you meet your mom and it's like okay first off that's not possible right because right? your mom's a character like mm-hmm. she's she's one of my favorite people like <laughs> For real, because she don't, she don't give a fuck. Right. Like she, I, I guess because she comes from the comedian background, right? Mm-hmm. That she has that thick skin yeah. of like, I know people are going to talk about me. Right. So I really don't care. Right. And I like, I love that about any individual period, but your yeah. mom does it and is still a loving individual. Mm-hmm. Cause when I get into that <laughs> mode, right? Like I'm not, I don't really care about people. Right. Like, like when I'm like, feelings hurt too bad yeah, like like i don't care how you feel about me and i also don't care about how you feel period like yeah that'd be my like i go to that extreme but your mom still be like oh i don't care how you feel about me but i oh you, that, yeah like, she'll still comfort you in some way shape or form yeah so i i you know now knowing all of those things yeah i you know it would be hard for me to be like oh brie is a super serious individual but mm-hmm. one of the illest moments that um, you know, we've gone through was being able to watch you become super comfortable mm-hmm. in who you actually are, yeah. right? Like when you're in a, when you're getting into a relationship, everybody has the facade, Yep. right? Like I call it, I call it the, the, the fart point, <laughs> right? Like at, at the point that you're comfortable enough to fart in mm-hmm. front of your significant other, that's when like, all guards are down yeah to me that's just when i feel like yo all guards are down like it's like yo you gonna know me inside and out literally like and so i think that one of my favorite moments or part of uh, i can't say that i can't pinpoint a specific moment but i can just say that like part of the thing that's been so enjoyable in this relationship has been our ability to develop more in ourselves and be comfortable in the development and showing that to our partner with, you know, to one another without it being awkward or without feeling like we're going to be judged or, Mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? There's very few moments where I feel awkward or weird around you. Like, I think it's, it's a lot of comfort there. I'm trying to really think like, has there been a moment where I've been like, or you know just awkward around you Mm -hmm. i don't know i i'm fully let loose now so but i thought about something faking it till you make it in relationships i feel like the real comes out at the most inconvenient time if you continue to fake who you are or what you're about Mm -hmm. When the real comes out, mm-hmm. it's not going to be good for anybody in a relationship because that person's going to be like, what, who are you mm-hmm. exactly? Mm-hmm. And we've seen this recently <laughs> um, with Carmen oh. and <laughs> and how you put on a facade for so long. I feel like the longer you do that, the worse it's going to get. Yeah, because um, I in the end. took her out to eat and oh all my that God. stuff, man. <laughs> can't believe that you and this 52 dollars <laughs> that bill was a lot more than that that was just her portion because she right. wanted to have drinks and all types of stuff <laughs> but shit nah i definitely i definitely feel like you're right and 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 like once the truth does come out especially depending on how long it's been right like yeah. now you're intertwining relationships mm-hmm. right because you have a right to feel some type of way about that situation because yep. you've had emotional attachment there right? right outside of just the fact that like yo you ain't about to do this to somebody that i love right let's just let's just go back and be like yo we've had honest moments of like yep. kicking it together like, that's where that anger and hurt came from no, i definitely yep. understand that that's why you never heard me tell you like yo chill out don't like don't mm-hmm. overstress don't over, like nah i just was always like the guy to just being like 
pull it back a little bit. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> pull it back just a little bit. Like get yours, but don't don't let them don't let them yeah. see you that you wanted that bad. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So, um, no, but I do get that. I definitely think that there's a, a huge danger in. I don't even want to say it's a danger. I just feel like with my significant other, that's the one person I'm supposed to be super comfortable with. Yeah. That's the one person where I'm not supposed to be really, really concerned about my image or my ego or, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. like no facades should be in the room when we are together, when it's yep. just me and you. So, you know, I think that it's, it's, I'm not going to say it's dangerous to fake it till you make it in a relationship. I think it's just super unhealthy and it's the opposite of being in a relationship. Yeah. It's also a lot of work and, as much as I do, I just, I can't fake in a relationship. Like, I feel like I should be able to decompress and, you know, just have that breath of fresh air. Um, that's a lot of work. It's a whole lot of work. And I don't remember a lot as is. So to lie and then try to remember that lie and then try to just keep up with that. It's, yeah, it's too I much. Have time for all that. It's I too don't much. Have time, energy or the desire to do those things. Right. You know what I'm saying? But. In you know, in in closing, right? In my in my perspective, I do think that in the business aspect of it, right? If you are obsessed or if you are passionate, faking it until you make it has its upsides. As long as you believe in yourself, mm-hmm. right? Like it, it all has to be about your end goal. What is it that you're yes. trying to accomplish with this? Because if it's only money, then like that's not never a good motivating tool. Because yep. number one, there's never enough, and then number two, like you're not chasing anything sustainable. Mm-hmm. You're not chasing anything of value. You're chasing things that have monetary value. And the crazier part about that is, as we've seen, they can change the value of that whenever they like. Like that. Just by printing more or creating interest hikes or, you know what I'm saying? So Literally saw a clip where Dame, da- recently Dame Dash just said that, like, they're creating currencies every day. Mm-hmm. If money is your only, you know, motivator, then you need to find something else. 100%. Because yeah. you are at the mercy of the people who are printing the money. Mm-hmm. And this is like, yo, you never going to win that game. Nope. Never going to win that game unless you buy your own money printer. <laughs> I should you, do that. Then you won. <laughs> you really won. Like you really up. But yeah, I mean that's all I got to say about faking until you make it. I think that it can uh, it can benefit you as long as you have the right motivation and the right tactics and the the right amount of passion mixed with obsession. I think that faking it until you make it is the definition of entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. Right? Like entrepreneurs will jump off a clip and build a airplane on the way down. So yep. like, no, I was never the guy who could run a business. I was never a studio owner until I decided to own a studio. Mm-hmm. Right. Like I feel that same way about me teaching people stocks. I was never a teacher. I wasn't the guy who was teaching people things. But what I did was I went backwards and I was like, okay, how do I learn? Mm-hmm. Let me try that. Uh, nope. That's not, that's not clicking. Okay, cool. Let me see how other people are teaching things and yeah. let me emulate that with my own style. Because I've never been a teacher. I never was the guy to be like, oh, this is this and this is how you get from A to B to C to D. I was never that guy because mm-hmm. I was always mentally going from A to B to C. I could tell you how to get from D to E, but I can't tell you how to get from A to B yeah. just because that my brain just didn't work like that. I used to get in trouble in math class because I would do solve problems in a different way than the yeah. teacher wanted us to. And I'd be like, yo, but I'm getting to the same result. Exactly. Are you mad about, you know what I'm saying? So for me, right, when it came to, to, to trying to uh, put people on to certain things, I had to fake it. I was faking it. The top of the, the top of the, uh, the, the, when the vid first came out. And I started making videos about, man, I didn't know what I was doing. People asked me to tell them stuff. So I was like, cool, this is why I'm going to do it. And then I was like, nah, let me actually get serious about this because mm-hmm. if it, it's fulfilling, it's rewarding. I like the idea of that. You're really helping give. people. Yeah. I, you know what it was? It was the, the results. Mm. It was when people were telling me that they made money and that their life was changing and all of these things. It was like, wait a minute. This is bigger than what I thought. This is way bigger than what I thought. It was twofold because number one, right? My goal was always to be able to push more knowledge and everything and the right mindset into my people. Cool. Mm-hmm. Lift your community. That's something that we all should do but it was a self-fulfilling uh mission as well because long term my goal is to have like an investing syndicate 
right? Like a group of individuals who we can all come and sit down and say like, yo, let's put our money yep. together and buy a town, buy a building, buy a block, buy this, buy that. And it don't just got to be me, yep. right? Like I can have other people there. So that once I really started to see my longer goal with this, it was like, wait a minute. Okay, cool. Now I have the real motivation to really go backwards and start telling people how to do the arbitrary things, the things that I find boring. Like I get it. I get it for multiple reasons reasons. Number one, I understand that my voice has been uh, blessed, I guess, with a tone and an ability to be able to convey things yep. that people can understand. Cool. Now that I know that I have that, I feel like it's a responsibility of mine. And let me just do my best to do it. But again, before all that, I was faking it. Mm -hmm. I was faking it. I was straight up just trying to be the best that I could. Yeah. And, you know, when people would tell me, shout rest in peace to Lionel, because Lionel was one of the people, I'll never forget the conversation that the last conversation that we had was him in my office sitting down and just being like, yo, bro, keep going. Like, yo, like, I love what you're doing, man. Like, yo, keep going, keep going. And I'm like, it's crazy because he was the guy that would have no fear to jump on the gram or whatever platform mm -hmm. he could and tell people a better way to be think live things that he was doing and i was like i ain't really trying to do all that i grew up in the era of like that's not cool. exactly you know you don't overshare so it was a, a wall for me to break down and he was a large part of me being able to break down that wall because he was the one that was, he was younger than me number one and so it was like man like my little brother's <laughs> homies like i ain't supposed to be listening to you yeah but 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 i respect you so much that like when he came to my office he wasn't coming to see me he was going to see rasheed mm -hmm. but i would see him and be like yo come in here like he was one of the few people of rasheed's friends that i would be like nah come in my office like let's just spend five minutes with me because i love this energy yeah and so like i said once he told me to keep going with it it was one of those things that really made me step backwards and be like okay like there are people who definitely see the potential in this to be something greater than I might see it yeah. or might feel. And so, again, that was when I started, I guess, making it right just because I started really believing in myself with it. But at first I was faking it. Mm. But it had some major results. It had it had the real results behind it to be like, oh, nah, people is actually getting paid. Oh, nah, people are listening and they, they want this information. Oh, okay, people are changing their lives. Yep. Like I've had people be like, yo, this situation that you put me in right here changed my life. Mm. Wow. That was, but that's when I was like, oh, snap. Okay, got it. Like It's bigger it. than me. Yeah, because it's like, yo, you know, you get to a point where you're like, oh, you know, I want to change the world or I want, you know, all of us to be able to be like this. And you realize that like, yo, as a culture, not to say we're too far gone, mm -hmm. but as a culture, one of the large problems that we have is focusing on the now. Yeah. And we need to be focusing on the future. Right. That's why a lot of people don't invest because they're so worried about how much money they have now. Mm -hmm. that They're like, I'm not about to put some money away now and then let it grow. I'm not going to plant a seed and hope that it becomes a tree. Like, no, nah, I'm trying to find it, the, the leaves that I can find now. Yeah. And so, like, when I started to 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 try to help people to switch that mentality, um, it was a challenge. Still mm -hmm. still is a yeah. challenge. But it was just part of the, the the driving factor in me to realize that, like, yo, this culture is not stuck in its ways or not hopeless or whatever. But if I instill some of the skills that I have into people that I know, my kids won't be the only kids who are affluent african-americans yeah. right we can create an entire community of people who have taught their children about stocks exact investments, same thing. things like that because now you can shape mindset mm -hmm. right at a younger age if you start them investing early you can shape their mindset and that's how you bridge the gap that's how you you know, fix the culture like mm -hmm. it's by changing mindset and the easiest way to do that is to give it to the people who are going to pass it down to other people yeah and so that's been the whole mission and game plan and um and that i was faking it <laughs> i was straight faking it i was straight faking it which is why i don't think i was super committed to it yeah because i never really believed in that 
light of myself. I never looked at myself as like a teacher or, you know what I'm saying? Somebody who could put people on and stuff. Mm-hmm. But now I've, I've, you know, seen so many other people who are like me start to do those things that I became comfortable. Yeah. in that, in that seat that I'm in. So that's awesome. You know, I love it. But we want to make sure that you guys, you know, love it as well and tell us. So make sure you're subscribed, comment and like the video. And of course, share it with others because we want to make sure that this, you know, type of content circulates and we get some engagement beyond Instagram. Uh, you do that so well because I be forgetting about <laughs> trying to instruct everybody to do some stuff. I just be stuck in our conversation. So. No, but that's how you know the convos be good because yeah. we really be like sitting here just chatting. But seriously, make sure you guys do all that engagement stuff and we'll keep the content coming. We promise to be consistent. So let's yeah, see. I think we got I think we got our <laughs> consistency dates down now. I think we have our ability to say this is what we're going to do and when we're going to do it. So. Hopefully we can. And we are going to release that unseen episode, too. At some point. I'm going to put it out. Why are you? What's, what's wrong? Why are you holding it? Why Listen, we're going we gonna to put it out at some point. We have some really dope content coming, Man, I'm too. I'm putting it out next week. I don't care what oh, you're talking about. Like. <laughs> it ain't nothing in it. Like, it's all good. Listen, it's the business of love. <laughs> <laughs> it's the business of love. Uh, any closing remarks? Nah, that's it. The episode, the, the other episode coming out. And soon. we are out. <laughs>